Bonjour à toutes et tous, vous écoutez First Print, votre podcast comics préféré pour une nouvelle émission du format Super Friends. On est dans notre run de, de Super Friends spécial FIBD, on va la rencontre des personnes qui font vivre la culture BD et la culture comics par leur travail et on est ravis d'avoir sur le podcast l'autrice canadienne Gillian Tamaki à l'occasion de la sortie de son nouvel album New York, New York, euh, Roaming en, en VO, qui est donc disponible aux éditions Rue de Sèvres. Une tranche de vie entre trois amis qui se retrouvent euh, voilà le temps d'un grand week-end à New York. On va pouvoir parler de bande dessinée avec Gillian. C'est un podcast qui est en anglais, évidemment. Donc, euh, on espère que vous l'apprécierez. Puis après, avec le générique, je vous laisse en compagnie de Gillian. So it's really nice to have you here, Gillian. Thanks for giving us a little bit of your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so for the people that might not know who you are, I'm always starting with the most basic question ever. Uh, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Who are you? Sure. That's a big question. Um, okay. Uh, but I, uh, my name's Gillian. I live in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'm originally from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, I am a uh, do a lot of things. I've been a freelancer for a long time, but, you know, comics, illustration, I teach, um, I do a ton of different kinds of illustration. Um, uh, I often work with my cousin, Mariko Tamaki, who does also a lot of superhero stuff. Um, and yeah, uh, just here in Uncle Lum. <laughs> so okay, can you tell us a little bit about your personal history with art? Uh, what drove you to, uh, to illustration? So I was one of those uh, kids that everybody said would be an artist because I was always drawing. And then, you know, I don't really, I believe in talent probably a little bit, but not that much. I think that you have a little bit of a aptitude and then people praise you. And when you're a little kid, that means a lot. And then you just keep on doing it. And then suddenly you're building up skills. So I was definitely one of those kids. And I didn't really like that that much. I was like, okay, but like, don't tell me what I'm going to be. Don't tell me what I should do with my life. So I actually, you know, even though I loved drawing um, and did a lot of it, I actually wanted to be like a vet when I was uh, like a veterinarian <laughs> uh, and or do something else. I explored all these other avenues and uh, because I really didn't um, like people telling me that I was going to be an artist. So Because uh, it was too much pressure on you? Or? No, it's just that nobody <laughs> likes to be told who they are by other people, okay. I think, you know. So uh, I did, you know, all the math and all the science when I was in high school, but I really wasn't like very good at that. Uh, and then, but eventually it's like, that is your talent. That is what you're strongest at. So I, I do believe you kind of have to follow your strengths and your opportunities. So I eventually uh, went to a little stint in fine art school and I was like, that's not for me. I'm not a fine artist. I want to be do something more applicable and more um, pragmatic, something uh, that was a little bit smarter mon money wise because my father is like an accountant. <laughs> I don't have artists in my family. You know, I didn't have any model of how to be an artist, a professional artist. So I was I went to design school thinking I would be a graphic designer and just get a regular job, you know, just a a, a paycheck. But I did, you know, th the program that I was in at the Alberta College of Art and Design had a lot of uh, illustration, uh, pro like uh, courses that you had to take. And I was much better at that. So, again, I was like, dang, I'm going to I'm I have to follow what I'm actually good at. And. So re reluctantly, I kind of followed that uh, path and I worked in video games right after school because, again, I was so timid to become a professional artist. You know, I was like, okay, well, this is a job. It's artistic and I'm working, you know, uh, in a creative field, but I'll be a, uh, I have a real job in video games. And then eventually I became a free, I was freelancing, moonlighting after hours and then And I had enough clients to become a, a freelance illustrator. And then I started making comics on my own. And now I make a lot of my time is making comics and books. So it was very incremental. Yeah. It's a long answer to your short question. But. Yeah, but that's that's <laughs> the way I like. Uh, yeah. Actually, I don't, it would be a, like, a, 
It, it's going to be a podcast. So if you're just saying, yes, <laughs> yeah, I love no. books and I love drawing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That was Gillian. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know. I, I feel like it's so funny. And I, I teach a lot too. And I think it's very um, helpful to, with when you're talking to students to say like, I didn't know anything. I didn't know I was going to do this when I was a teenager. In fact, I really resisted becoming an artist because it seemed a not very smart thing to do. Didn't seem viable. I was like, I should be responsible and I want to make money. It's not like I just said, I don't care about money. I just want to be an artist. No, no, no. I care about <laughs> being able to live and all this Correctly, stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so it was very, very uh, small steps to becoming like a full-time artist. Um, and did you have like a, an appetite for comics uh, where, when you were growing? So I uh, loved reading comics um, in the way that a lot of kids in North America do in terms of reading in them in the newspaper, you know, like you'd have the comics pages in the back of the newspaper every day. And I would read them every day. And we had Archie comics and the, you could buy those at the grocery store and they'd have them at kid height, you know, at the checkout when you're buying your groceries. So but, I but would correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, it seems to me to uh, the Archie in the groceries, it seems to me like it was really a, a really long time ago. And I'm uh, like in the, but in the 50s, 60s, but uh, you're not that old. Uh. Yeah. But they reprint them all the time. Oh uh, yeah. And yeah. they're still doing this yes, in the, yep. uh, in the and shops. And they update okay. the art. They'll, so they'll have these things where They, the books are, there will be a comic from the 50s and then mm. there'll be a comic from the 70s and then there'll be a comic from the 2000s and then there'll be a comic from the 60s, like all mixed okay, up. Yeah. So actually it was very interesting to have this book and you have all this range of art styles from all these artists for over decades. And I really started to be able to pick out, I love Dan DiCarlo, I love these styles and I don't really like these styles. So I feel, and I feel like I learned how to draw off of, you know, trying to copy Archie comics. And so uh, that was as a kid. And then I stopped reading comics because I think I aged out. Like now there's a ton of comics uh, and maybe it's this bit in this way in Europe and in Japan and stuff the whole time, but there really wasn't a kind of a, a, a industry comics industry for uh teenagers in America, like in the 80s and 90s, right? So uh, I didn't read comics for a long time. And then when I was in college, I had college friends that introduced me to um, the Hanukkah brothers and uh, Dan Klaus and um, all and Adrian, Adrian Tomine and all these indie comics that were happening in the 2000s and like late 90s and stuff. So That's when I started picking up reading comics again. And that's when I was like, oh, like that. This actually seems like uh, something I could do. I could try, you know, and, and actually at that time I was reading and really loving it. But also um, I did feel like there was an opportunity to make things that appeal to me as like a woman as well, because like it was mostly men besides like Julie Doucet like at that time that I was encountering personally. And especially that you were not maybe interested uh, in the mainstream comic books uh, the ho the whole superhero stuff but I wanted to know also because you, uh, in Canada I guess that's not there's not many differences in terms of accessibility to comic books. You also have a comic shop uh, the direct market and you can find everything here. Yeah I never had an interest in mainstream comics personally um, and In Canada, there often the especially where I gr was going to school, Calgary, um, there were not indie comic shops. They were all kind of together. <laughs> you know, you would have stores that sold a lot of mainstream comics, and then also have a selection of indie graphic novels. And I think it's m relatively recently where you'll have a book a, a bookstore that sells only, you know graphic novels but even the big bookstore in toronto now which is you know the cornerstone of comic sellers the beguiling still sells a lot of mainstream comics even they're no even though they're known for being an indie comic book store okay and uh, so uh, at what point uh, did you uh, decide that uh, you yes you were going to be a, a comic book artist or a graphic novel artist uh, and how you prefer to to say it Oh, I, yeah, I call myself a cartoonist. I don't really yeah, I <laughs> feel cartoonist. too bad about, you know, that that term. It's so funny that I'll work. Sometimes I'll be doing stuff for um, like a like a magazine or newspapers and they'll call me like 
a graphic novel. Like they, they're very, they don't know if I want to be called a cartoonist. They, they're, they're sort of like, oh, they'll call it a little graphic novella <laughs> for like a one page thing. I'm like, it's okay to call it a comic. Um, so that still persists. But, um, so, uh, I, Actually, the first comic I made was when I was working at the video game company. And really, I was 23 um, and living on my own for the first time. And I was living in a new city and I was really experiencing um, a lot of new things as an adult for the first time <laughs> and figuring out uh, how to live in this new place and Edmonton, Alberta. And I was very actually for the first time, like inspired to make something about an experience I was having and try to understand it and share that experience with other people. And so how to do that, um, you know, it, I don't have it, comics is what I think is wonderful about comics. It's very accessible. You don't need a ton of money. You don't need a ton of tools. And I was like, well, I can draw. I don't really know how to write, but you know, I can make a wordless comic, you know? <laughs> so that was the first comic that I made. And it was a mini comic that I just printed myself out. Uh, I printed out myself and I took it around to all the comic book stores in <laughs> the city that I was living in. And I mailed it to like everybody that I knew. I mean, I mailed it to Drawn and Quarterly, who I now publish with. And I just mailed it around. And I think I sold some online. And that was the first time I made a comic. Yeah. Was it hard to uh, uh, um, define uh, what would be your drawing style? I, I guess you, you mentioned Daniel Close or Adrian mm -hmm. Tamine. Uh, maybe Scott McCloud also was uh, one of your influences or not? Uh, I, I mean, Scott McCloud was definitely one of those people that I, when I became serious, I was like, I want to start to learn how to make comics. I just read a ton of comics and he was obviously one of those people. I don't know that he maybe influenced my thinking about making comics, but I don't know that he influenced my comic style. Um, style is very interesting because I don't think that I have a, a, a very fixed style. I think you can always see the threads throughout all the things I do. I hope you can. But um, in terms of some of the more superficial qualities of um, mark making and uh of design i think i do try to switch it up a little bit um but i do trust and i do hope that somebody can see the um through lines or the uh the core things in my work that let link all these different techniques and approaches Yeah, because the style from uh, the, between this one summer or uh, roaming is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, work with? Are you a, a traditional artist? Are you uh, doing uh, this uh, digitally? So this one summer and Skim, our first book um, with my first book with Mariko, uh, was done traditionally with a, a brush pen, mm. and roaming or New York, New York in France was done completely digitally, <laughs> and partially just because. I was bored with doing the brush pen. I did a lot of professional work in my brush in the br in a brush pen. I did those two books in a brush pen, and people love the brush pen because it's very romantic. You know, it's very expressive. Um, it's beautiful, but I was like kind of bored of it because I had done so much work in that technique, and. Uh, And it, I had gotten to that wonderful point where it's it is ink, but it's almost like a pencil to me, you know, because it was so you're so comfortable in it. But like at some point you do I you do want to try a new challenge. Right. So in this case, the challenge was color, uh, which the other two books were not in color. And so I wanted to do something in color and digital just made sense. And I love like that clear line, Hergé, mm. you know, uh, clear line style. Not that this is so strictly clear line, but it is inspired, I think, a, a little bit by that. And I have done books like in a nib pen and stuff like that. And you're, you're also, uh, I've not read uh, all uh, of your uh, bibliography because not everything is accessible in France. Mm. Uh, but uh, you 
exclusively doing uh, graphic novels. You're not doing serialized uh, c comic books. And I guess also it was a, a choice, maybe even because you uh, prefer the length uh, you have in a graphic novel, or maybe it's just in a, a question of the, the audience that you can get uh, between uh, comic books and uh, graphic novels in the United States and Canada. Yeah, in North America, serialized comics are really almost gone, you know, in terms of printed, you know. I, even when I started, there would be little serialized things like Optic Nerve, you know, Adrian Tomine's like um, series. And I, I think it's a real shame because I think serialized comics make more sense for people in terms of economics. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a big ask to just tell somebody, especially somebody if they've just graduated from art school, they have to now go away and make a 300 page or 200 page giant graphic novel. Um, is not, really that's very um a big proposition that's really difficult to do even as a professional so even so somebody starting out um i think they do feel that pressure to like pitch a graphic novel instead of just starting and making serialized work i have serialized work especially um uh the web comic i had which i had from like 2010 2015 it's called super mutant magic academy it is a book now um but it's been online It hasn't really been printed. And I have just felt like printed serialized comics are not viable, unfortunately, in North America now. It is more of an online thing. Mm. Yeah. And that's not something that you, you, you would want to do? I would love to, but I also like don't know. I need to get paid to do it somehow. And I don't mm. know who's like paying for that. So, so what, you're an artist and you're not doing comics for free? I know. I'm I'm still that accountant's daughter, man. I, <laughs> I can't like, I really, it's funny you say that because I go and talk to students a lot and money's like a constant topic that I'm talking about because I don't think it serves anybody very, you know, especially when talking to students, like to disregard that. And like, we don't work in a vacuum. We work within industries and industries are very subject to the overall economy and all these things and production and material costs and all the, and, and so I think it's, uh, something I think about a lot and I, I, I couldn't imagine not taking that into account in terms of what projects I take and what kind of books, like I, I was, I was just thinking that I made that web comic when Tumblr was popular, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to the 2010s. Um, and that totally shaped the, the size of those pages. It was that platform. And so now that platform's gone. And I don't know that there is a comics publishing platform online that I would publish on because Instagram isn't the best for serialized comics. They all have to be the same size, the panels. So, We, comics, the shape of comics is so informed by the platforms that we publish on and the economy that we are making work within. But you could just, just open a website and post the pages or do, uh, do, do a sub stack. Yeah. That is true. Or Patreon, which is a lot of what a lot of people do. Yeah, no, that's definitely a possibility in the future. Uh, would you say that the, the changes that uh, are uh, coming Uh, right now through the comics industry are for the better or is it a uh, maybe do you think that's maybe you you'd had a harder time right now if you wanted to uh, to be a oh yeah an for, for my kind of the kind of artist that yeah. i am i was very lucky to come up at the time where um indie comics were kind of hot you know because mm -hmm. you had that wave of the 2000s of you know of of and and some of the 90s of that first wave I was talking about like Dan Klaus and and uh uh Seth and Chester Brown but then like the move into more mainstream publishing with um uh Gene Yang and uh uh like Bone and uh Blankets and like there was like and Mount and Persepolis and all that stuff they like there there was really Book public traditional book publishing was becoming very interested in uh, indie comics, and at the same time, there were so many festivals and so much energy around DIY comics and indie comics, and um, the internet was all kind of starting out, you know. And so that community was very online, and we 
there was just a lot of energy at that time, you know, uh, and there were, for example, somebody that I came up with was Raina Telgemeier of like smile and all that stuff. And we would go to cons together and now look at her. She's like on top of the world. Um, and she was really in that crew and it was all mixed up. There was no, not as many divisions between, oh, you make kids for com- c- uh, comics for kids and oh, you make comics for adults. And, and it for was young all, adults now. And, uh, yeah, it was all mixed up in this sort of like. 2000s 2010 like scene of um indie comics in north america and and i feel like now it's a little bit less informal it's more professionalized it's more it's like formal. A, a market uh, yes with- and people come into it mm. people come into it with like um uh more professional aspirations where i feel like a lot of the time what was happening in in the 2000s was they weren't hobbies they were very very serious but um it was just i don't know it was just a different attitude mm. and i don't blame and i don't blame you know people coming in with like cuz times change right but i was just very lucky to come along when i did and i had a thing that was these sorts of books drawn in these sorts of ways but it was about young women and that was that i think that filled a hole and people were very excited and that's why i got some of the opportunities that i did How do you choose uh, the the project uh, that you're working on? Uh, I mean, uh, and especially with the one that you're doing with uh, Mariko, uh, how do you choose uh, which one you're gonna gonna write and draw, and the one that uh, you you do with with uh, Mariko? Yeah, I well, in that case, we started working together very organically. Like most, I won't say. I mean, I will say a lot of comics teams are put together by the editorial or, or by the publisher, right? Like they're like they, they'll buy a script. And then they will select an artist that they think goes well, and then they'll pair those people together, much like a traditional picture book, which I have done. I have done illustra- illustrations for somebody else's manuscript who I've never met, you know. But um, <laughs> yeah, but that's that's picture books. That's very typical with comics. Um, I've never done that. Um, I've I started working with my cousin very early on in my journey of making comics around the mid 2000s because you knew that she's or she was also writing and she, she was, was yeah she mm. was starting out as a writer and a screen a you know screenplay uh screenwriter and uh and an actor and a performance artist and stuff and she had she came across an opportunity again through DIY indie <laughs> feminist um performance art her circles uh Uh, they were kickstarting their own, not literally kickstarting, not w- with Kickstarter, but they were starting their own little project of small, uh, floppy comics, a little comic series. And they, she, a friend said to her, Hey, do you want to do one of these comics? I'm pairing, uh, people who have never written comics with people who have never drawn comics. And I'm just want to, what could go wrong? This <laughs> is cool. Yeah. It was just like, That's so free, you mm. know, that's so, let's just see what happens. And I miss a little bit of that attitude, right? Um, let's just see what happens. I got some money from the Canadian government and like, you can have a thousand dollars to like do this thing. So my, she, my cousin heard about this opportunity. She's like, I, my, my cousin Jillian just graduated from art school. Maybe she wants to make this 24 page comic with me. And I said, sure, because I was starting to make comics on my own. And um, so that was our first little comic skim. And that ended up being the thing we could take around. And then we sold it to make a bigger graphic novel. So, yeah, again, it seems so Uh, magical <laughs> in retrospect to just be like let's just pair all these people that have never made comics together and see what happens but that's what it takes i think to like bring new people in right and like it was such a wonderful way to start because it wasn't a 400 page graphic novel it was just a 24 page little thing that had a very limited print print run and it wasn't um it was very low stress i think there's such value in low stakes <laughs> projects that you don't get paid that much to do, but you learn and you cut your teeth. And um, there's like a real value in that. From uh, this one summer to uh, New York, New York, uh, yeah. uh, the story that you are, that you're drawing are really uh, like uh, in uh, our real world. You, you mm. could say it's like just a slice of life. 
you're not putting uh, any uh, fantasy or science fiction, science fiction uh, elements. Uh, do you think is it something that you really prefer to do? Like you, you really prefer to uh, just to speak about people uh, in real life? I do, and I always have been like that, even as a kid. I never really liked fantasy. I didn't like sci-fi, <laughs> which is funny because my mom, like my mom, is a huge nerd. Like she's like a sci, like a Star Trek. Like super fan, Star Wars watches every <laughs> sci-fi thing. She and when we were kids, she would like show us Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Like she's like such a nerd. But like myself, I think I've always been really attracted to reality, you know. And it's not; it's always like a heightened reality. But um, yes, replicating the real world in miniature. I find very satisfying. And uh, especially with New York, New York, it is such a specific place. New York City 2009 is such a specific time and place. And like, I love that challenge of trying to shrink the world, you know, and I just find it funny, like people's haircuts in 2009 with like, you know, spiky and long at the same time and like shrinking that down and putting that on a character in a book is like just hilarious to me. Um, but between those two, uh, uh, this one summer and roaming New York, New York, uh, my challenge to myself for this one summer was to be quite traditional, quite, uh, straightforward, uh, to not have surreal elements, uh, to keep it pretty stuck to the grid. You know, I didn't want to have, um, a lot of formal uh, tricks or um, I don't want to say inventiveness, but I just wanted to keep it very, very straightforward. So, so it sticks to that grid very tightly. Um, and, but with this other book uh, roaming, I wanted to break that a lot um, because it is about ki young w women, young people in the big world, you know, and they're like little tiny people being like flung around this universe. Right. So there is a lot more playfulness and experimentation in the layout and also in Le the imagery. Less, less panels like. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And to just expand that, you know, like and there is more surrealness in uh, roaming to just heighten their emotional state and their state of consciousness <laughs> and like when they get high they're floating through the universe you know when they're feeling love they're you know flying with butterflies all this stuff so there's like a surreal element to it that i was just trying to use to heighten the emotion of that story i, I think i read it was a an, uh, an idea from you uh, at the at the origin that you wanted to do a, a new comic, uh, mm. comic a new comic uh, sorry a new graphic novel with uh, with mariko yeah. it, I guess it's some kind of uh, an autobi autobiographic uh, no, story or not? Well, they're not autobiographical. None of the books that we do are autobiographical. You know, like they are kind of inspired by environments, I find. For example, this one summer, which is my cousin wrote that script, like she would spend summers in a similar cottage, you know, for a couple of weeks every year. So that's... But that's where the similarities end. For my, in my case, for New York, New York, it was that I had gone to um, uh, New York for the first time as a college student in my freshman year, my first year of college, and with a friend that I knew. I wasn't best friends with her by any. I actually hadn't met her. She was a pen pal with a friend that I knew. And then she brought another friend that I had never met before. And then, but everything else after that is completely uh fictional <laughs> but um so it's like kind of just the very first kernel is like there's like a truth to the situation but then everything else that actually happens is fictional and it, it's actually very inspired by my time living in new york for 10 i lived there for 10 years so it was also trying to understand my relationship to that place as an ex New Yorker as well. <laughs> and what's so special about New York for you? The energy, you know, and the the friction and the people. Like the I <laughs> I miss New Yorkers every day. <laughs> like they are just 
Um, I moved back to Toronto. I love Toronto, but I there's something about like Toronto people <laughs> that like make me miss New Yorkers. There's a little bit of a remove. They're a little bit. It's cold is not. They're very polite, but they're not warm. You know, whereas I feel like a New Yorker will. They're very clear with you. If you're standing in the wrong way on the street, they're going to tell you. They're just going to say they're going to yell at you. You know, <laughs> Get out of the way. You're blocking the way. But they'll also tell you, I, I love your coat. You know, like they're just more like open in that way. And like, I really miss like you can strike up a conversation. Maybe that's Americans in general. You can strike up a conversation with anybody like anywhere. And I really, really miss that. So. There's that. And also being an artist there was amazing because, wait, well, of course, you're around all these, this amazing artwork. It's the same probably as in Paris, right? You're just you have the best of the best that you can go look at. However, in addition to that, there every person in New York, <laughs> not every person, but a lot of the artists in New York are like, the type A personality, most driven person from their town or country, and they come to New York. And so you have a city of very driven, very ambitious people. <laughs> and, and that energy propels you upwards, you know, because you're challenged by them. They're challenged by you. And that competitiveness really accelerates your growth. You know, like you're just pushing each other and you really can improve your skill and um, uh, really immensely in an environment like that very quickly. And so that energy and that competitiveness I found very useful for a time. At some point, I think I ran it stopped being useful to me, but it is amazing that friction and that sort of um, that energy can really be transformative as an artist and i guess that you didn't have to make any researches because as you've lived there for 10 years you just had to pick up the the best place you wanted to draw and, and oh there was a ton it. of research oh, yeah <laughs> because yes it was there was a lot of my memory was mm. you know for example they go to uniqlo <laughs> and uniqlo was new at that time and people were losing their minds and so i wanted to have a, that that was very true to that time in new york of just like there's a uniqlo here oh my god yeah, yeah because you mentioned it before but just 2009 is also a really special year yeah. to you or for new york it was just that it was that's the new york that i know okay. because i was i moved there 2005 And I moved away 2015. So that's it's smack and dab in the middle of the New York that I remember because cities change, right? That New York doesn't exist anymore, you know, because cities remake themselves like every every day, every year, you know. But um, back to the research thing, though, is that I was going to go um, and take photos like I have done with every book. Uh, but then COVID happened. So they shut the border between Canada and the States. So I couldn't go down and take all any re reference photos. But at the same time, like I just said, the city has changed so much. It's not really the same city as like 2009 anyway. So it was, there was so much research to get those details correct um, by going online and going on Flickr. <laughs> I don't remember. No, if you remember that platform, but I didn't Flick even have the the time to use it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was already gone. Yeah, exactly. It was already gone. <laughs> but that was a platform. Again, we're talking about platforms and how they they live and die too. That was so popular at that time. So every tourist <laughs> from that went to New York uploaded all their photos onto Flickr and YouTube, and uh, it's amazing what people will have put online. Like, like I, for example, there is a scene in the Eminem's uh, flagship Times Square store, this like insane building that's just like an Eminem store. And people have taken like 20 minute videos of just walking through the store and looking at all the things on the shelf. And you're like, who is, would this video have been for? But like me, <laughs> like 12 years later. Like, thank God somebody took these these crazy videos of like or 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 Newark Airport, just like of of pictures of the seats and stuff. And I'm like, I 
thank thank God they did because then I could make this book because it's I can't just do I have to get the detail right. You can't just put a seat in the airport. It's Newark Airport 2009. There is a specific design of seat that I needed that was there. So I needed to find out what it looked like. And was it one bank of seats? Was there a seat behind it? Like all those details. Like I can't just uh, fake it. I have to get it completely correct or else it'll drive me crazy. So there was a lot of research, yeah. Okay, my, I, I stand corrected. No, <laughs> I just, it's so funny because it's supposed to be ideally invisible though. You're not supposed to notice that kind of thing, right? You're just supposed to make, it's supposed to feel right. You know what I mean? It's just, and, and it's when you're doing all that research, you're like, nobody is going to care about this, but I care. And also I think it makes it feel correct in a very, subliminal way <laughs> is it hard to do a, a good uh, character design uh because you have the the art the the how they look but uh, also it's a i guess there's a, a relationship between how they look and how they will behave that's a great question i um yes i've got one <laughs> 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 the other 10 before were lousy but this no, one is great <laughs> they're all great and this one is just even more great um Yeah, so I actually don't love character design. <laughs> I I approach it more um, pragmatically. Like they have to look really different <laughs> because sometimes you're going to draw them from you know really far away, and you have to be able to tell them apart. So it's really helpful if one of them's short and one of them's tall, and one of them's bigger, and one of them has short hair, and one of them has long hair and they have different colored hair like it's more like that that they are like how to distinguish them of course then you know i think the secondary thing and this is always whether it's panel layout or clothing or anything it should emphasize their personalities so one of one example of that is fiona there's a character called fiona in roaming who um is uh very exuberant very loud personality, very concerned with her individuality. <laughs> so she had to wear different clothes every day, you know, uh, and she had to wear a lot of jewelry and she's not the type of person that would wear the same jewelry every day. Like she has to have different jewelry every day, <laughs> which um, I think was very true to her character. And she had to wear different shoes every day and her, her hair had to be different every day. And that's very true to that personality of that character. However, my life would have been a lot easier <laughs> as the artist if she could just wear the same thing every day. And I didn't have to keep track of, you know, what side is her hair clip on? <laughs> her ring is uh, on her ring finger on her left hand. Like I had to have somebody at the publisher go through the entire book just to make sure that her earrings were in the right ear you know, and that her rings were on the right finger and stuff. So continuity was very difficult, but that was what was correct for that character. Yeah. And I guess you also chose to, uh, to have three characters because I guess the, the dynamic uh, in a group are uh, more interesting in story rise. Uh, if you're three people instead of just two. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess there is like, it's a kind of a love triangle triangle in a way, but you're right. Like there's, Traveling, okay, so you can be friends with somebody, but it's a whole different thing to travel mm. <laughs> with a, with somebody. And like some friends you're just like not meant to travel with. So yeah, I think the three created a nice pull, like a push and pull thing. You know, when you travel with people, I feel like um, in a little, if you when you travel in a little group like that, everybody has their strengths. Like some people are really good at finding good food <laughs> or they're really good at finding good coffee. And then other people are really organized, right? They're the ones that book the tickets and they're the ones that make sure that you get to the train on time. And they're the ones that figure out how to use the subway or they're the ones that have used, figured out, uh, watched a YouTube video to show you how to like use a taxi or whatever. So then you have those people and then you have people that are the spontaneous people that like just, you know, can sweep you away and bring you to an ex 
push you all to do something a little bit off the beaten path. And that's the most magical moment. So, so everybody has their strength in a group like that. And then everybody has their bad part too of just like they get really mean when they're hungry Uh uh-oh like somebody's hungry like we gotta go get a croissant because like (laughs) she's gonna lose her mind you know and then somebody is like too timid or somebody's too reckless like and so that was the beauty beauty of having a a three a group of three is that you could explore all of their strengths and weaknesses and what they brought to the group and how they clash and yeah well, i really feel that uh, like uh, the the whole uh, point of new york new york was also to speak about uh, how uh, you grow up about gr- just growing up because uh, the end you haven't seen each other for, for quite a long time and they discover throughout the whole uh, weekend that maybe they uh, they they have they have changed is it something that was important to to you also because maybe you had a a, a, a similar experience with a, a friend or don't you think that change is like the most horrible thing in the world yeah but because you 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 seem to you, <laughs> i have nostalgia about re- friendship that i had yeah. like 10 years ago or so so yeah. it it spoke to me the oh, the, the the scene in the park when they uh, i know it's like It's, uh, I think friendship and friend, you changing and your friend changing, which happens a lot in childhood, but actually still I'm learning can still continues as you're an adult, like, um, is so melancholy to me (laughs) and it's like, so, um, sad (laughs) and difficult. And so that's been a, a, a thread in all of our books with Marie, my books with Mariko Skim and this one summer And this book where you're getting, it's like the first inklings that you're like drifting apart, but you're in a little bit of denial (laughs) that that's actually happening because even if it's some, even you're changing and you're necessarily changing, like, um, it's, it's very painful. And like, that's the dynamic between the two old friends, Zoe and Danny, where uh, Zoe is changing as a human being and Danny doesn't want to let her go, you know, and it doesn't negate their previous relationship and friendship, but that's just life. But like, it's so, so painful. Uh, and so, uh, there's nothing real. There's no, con- no, no, uh, conclusion to come to. It's just, I just think I would just try to capture that exquisite pain <laughs> mm. of um of growing up and change and and you never you know just wake up one day and you're like a new person right it's always like a transitional time uh and then everybody around you is confused and like what are, what's going on and um and you have to detach like sometimes you have to like actually reject you know so because like that's what needs to happen but it doesn't make it any less painful so. because even in even in the book that like you have a, an open conclusion we we don't have all the plots resolved yeah. uh, you just let it let it, letting the, the, them go uh is it hard to uh not have a, a a straight ending yeah i mean i i kind of love that because it's like i don't know what's even gonna happen mm-hmm. you know like i have inklings but i i don't know what's going to happen to these characters either <laughs> and um i think that's very canadian actually to have um because there's like some of our best writers are women writers and women short story writers alice monroe is uh, one of my favorite writers and she's like one of our most beloved writers and she what she does is she's like the master of a short story and what she does is she takes an incident in somebody's life or a time, like a brief window of somebody's life typically. And within that brief window, she will drop in these, it's, it's not, they're not flashbacks, but there are like clues to what brought that character there and that life, that life that person had leading up to and, and why they're in the situation that they are now. And then even in the same way, it's not an epilogue, but she'll drop things that will hint to the li- the life after this story, you know? Um, and it's done very, it's woven in. It's not like it's tacked on at the beginning and it's tacked on at the end. Like it's all woven into the story itself. And I think I've been very influenced by that 
very organic mode of like hinting at the before and then hinting at the what happens after, you know, so that's a huge influence on me. But it's like, I actually don't know what happens to them either. So not doing a, a New York, New York sequel. Maybe, it, yeah, it's like I can't think of a. Yeah, like I, I don't know. The only thing I could see picking up again would be Super Mutant Magic Academy, and they're all like <laughs> grown ups and like working in coffee shops or something. <laughs> Is it difficult to uh, set a mood for for a scene because there are some quite some uh, very uh, difficult moments, especially when the. When Fiona uh, uh, at the end is really going through something that is quite hard, how do you uh, make uh, feel the the tenseness uh, in a in a situation? It's a great question. Second one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better. <laughs> um. Yeah. You know what's the first? I mean, there's many different ways, right? Like they're how they, their body language. I mean, so much of my storytelling is body language. Yeah, you so know? that was my next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's definitely part of it, and I'll save it for the next question. But I, I'm actually what's what ch jumped out when you asked me was some of the um, layouts, you know, and some of the actual formal pacing and the layout uh, of the pages, and in some way of like because you can like. Um, speed up time and you can compress time um, and you can drag out time through some of that pacing through the panels and then um, and the size of the panel you know oh no, just no, yeah. oh and the, sorry this <laughs> <laughs> so you can drag out time you can compress time you can um, speed up the like action, you know, um, and you can make the panels bigger. You can have kind of an explosion by um, doing a, a a full bleed spread, you know, where you really like break all the panels together. So I would actually say it's more, my first instinct was to say the paneling of it. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, there's, they get into a bit of a scrap with a taxi driver who is a young man who is their age, right? But has a totally different life, like leading up to this moment together, you know, like he's like working, right? Like, um, and they kind of abuse him a little bit, you know, or they kind of like, like I'm not going to say what happens, but like, he's really mad at them, right? And he's not just a service worker now. Whereas like in these cities, like sometimes tourists treat locals like service workers or to their experience, you know, and like it's broken in that moment that like he's a real person. Right. And he's like really pissed off at them. And so there is a big panel of his face and he I took the time to really shade his face, you know, and more so than any other character, even the main characters in the book, you know, so he has like a big panel and his face is very rendered more so than any other character. And uh, just to make him like a real person, you know, so I think you can do and that hopefully will increase the intensity. So I actually think it's more through some of the formal choices that you can raise the intensity of a scene. And so my next question was uh, about the body language because uh, I really liked it. I, had, I noticed that you could uh, uh, tell so, so many things with just a, a glimpse or with a touch, uh, a slip of the hands. And uh, you really took some of the time for uh, different uh, pages to really show just uh, bodies uh, interacting and s uh, without dialogues. And uh, I wanted to know how important was to you body language in terms of uh, uh, narrative uh, design? Hugely. I mean, that is something that I think I lucked into a little bit with um, my schooling because, again, it was such an old fashioned program <laughs> that I was in that we just did a ton of like skeleton anatomy projects. <laughs> like we had to learn the muscle charts. We had to draw. We did a ton of life drawing. We'd have three hour life drawing sessions. Um life painting sessions like it was drawing a lot from the body and studying like how body mechanics so i've always been drawn to that anyway you know but um i think that i inadvertently happened upon a program that encouraged that so uh so 
body expression is a huge part of my personal sto- storytelling because I think it's really powerful, right? Like, um, I say this all the time, but like, it's like if you are in, a, if your friend walks into a room or your partner walks into a room, you can tell within a split second whether something's wrong with them. You're like, what's wrong? <laughs> like, are you okay? You know, uh, because of just the way they carry themselves, you know, or they're like tiny expression, like tiny little movements to their face. You can just tell there's something wrong or something good or whatever. So I try to tap into that and just be able to and try to tell the story through these characters, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be big. It can be really, really small. And so I, you have to trust the reader that they will pick up on that, mm. you know. Yeah. So you mentioned before that you were also doing digitally uh, New York, New York, because you wanted the use of colors, but you're not uh, like using colors in a very uh, uh, mm. diverse palette. Uh, you're you're sticking to uh, also to to uh, color moods, I, I, I guess. Yeah. So what were your choices uh, when you decided to do with colors, but not too many? Not too many. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So the truth is that I don't actually love working in color. Oh, so <laughs> you wanted, were lying to me. That's, I wanted that's great. To do, I, <laughs> I wanted to do a color book because I think that, again, this is a little bit like cynically like money thinking. Like I do think that there is now an expectation like definitely not when i started where i think black and white comics were more accepted and now i think like because graphic novels are especially with ya like very colorful that now i think there is an expectation of color in a way so i wanted to do a color book um and it's an it, it is another challenge but i love black and white like i think that the possibilities for black and white art are like endless almost, you know? So I still, I wanted it to be in color. I wanted the color to me, you know, to, to not be supplementary, but I still wanted it all to hang within black and white artwork. So the, the color is somewhat muted, um, but they don't have a big meaning themselves. You know, like with this one summer, there was, the, at least in the American edition, it was done in a kind of a, a purpley blue. And that was to evoke kind of a melancholy, nostalgic mm-hmm. feeling. I don't think that there's so much meaning in these colors uh, personally, but um, but it was uh, so they were kind of more like workhorse colors that I chose. <laughs> but it was they were to sit back a little bit and 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 like really let the black shine through yeah and there's also uh, in uh, in the new york new york a little bit of nudity and uh, lesbian love uh and i read that uh, this one summer was like on the list of banned <laughs> books uh, at some time for this uh, this kind of thematic so were you restraining yourself also in uh, depicting the this uh, lo- love story because uh, i've heard of, of a lot that uh, banned books are s- still a thing in the united states and north america I'm just going to check my schedule yeah. just to make sure that I'm like not going to be late for a panel. So let me just check this very, yes. very quickly. And then... Okay, I miss only we had an hour, so... Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's at 11.30. Okay. And it's 10.30 now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, perfect. Whew, I just want to... I'm like, is it, it's not 10.30, is it? It's 11.30. Good. Okay. Well, it's like a little break. Yes, so uh, this one summer was very, very banned. <laughs> Um, uh, which like sucks, you know, I think it's like, I think it's actually genuinely awful. Um, and so part of that was this one summer one, cette la in French, one, um, Could you say say it again? C'est that they la? Oui, oui, très bien. Okay, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm like, oh God. I was surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, un- I, I did do f- like three years of French immersion. I mean, Canadian, they teach you a little bit of French, but it's like Quebecois French and oh, okay. I'm horrible. Anyway, <laughs> so um, so uh, it, it was, it won some big uh, awards for young readers you know, and that is where most books, banned books yeah. come from. It's from like picture books and young reader books. Cause it's like the thing of, we want to protect, sh- the kids. protect, protect the children, yeah. you know, like 
we can't let them know that anything distressing ever happens in life, you know? <laughs> so, um, so with this book, we were kind of intentional about it not being a YA book, that it is a book for adults. Mm. And that um, I think there's actually now another term of new adult. It's not young adult. It's new adult. We have to always invent new it's, categories. Yeah, it's just marketing. Completely, 100%. Okay. And it's categories, right? Like, it, you, if you talk about, like, libraries and book selling, you know, like, which are important parts of the book ecosystem, right? Um, those categories are helpful in a way, I guess. So, um, but we were pretty intentional of, like, these are ni- these are adult they're young people, right? But they are 19. Like they are adults doing adult things. So it was a choice to be able to show that completely or more completely to not try to go for an adult, for, sorry, not try to go for a young adult audience. And so you didn't have like a, an editor, uh, did you have an editorial output from for uh, this kind of scene or everything in general? Uh, is it something that uh, you have like a, emailing then you can do this or you should do that uh. actually no we've been very very lucky um because like um i don't think that i'm a very dark person you know like i it's not like i'm i'm uh repressing a lot <laughs> i'm just like i would love to do like uh murder and all these things but it's like i can't do it because that's not marketable it's not like that at all right. um so uh in reality, I think a lot of young people, older teenagers, would probably really like ro- roaming, but we're not going to tech. We're not going to technically market to them, and it, it's a little. It is a little bit of a relief to not have to worry about like some of that scrutiny because it is like for adults too. So um, I don't really feel like it changes my approach at all. Um, it, again, it just kind of felt right for the story in this story. And what can you tell us a little bit about the future? The future. Uh, okay. The, um, like I said, this book, you know, 440 pages or something. Yeah, it's really big. Is, uh, was done totally digitally. And so that's a lot of sitting around at your computer <laughs> or on your iPad. I kind of flipped between Photoshop and Procreate with this. Um, and uh, so very digital for years. And now in response, I want to do something very handmade, you know, and like analog. So I'm, I am also, this is totally different planet, but I also make a lot of um, textiles. Like I'll, I quilt and I do embroidery and applique and I do it more on the illustration side of my career. (laughs) Like I've done book covers and stuff like that. um, Embroidered. And now, and then I want to, so now I want to try to bring like narrative story into fabric and textile and sewing and stuff like that. And so I'm working on that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you a lot again for your time. Uh, Jillian, it was really a pleasure to have uh, this chat uh, with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really great questions. Thank you very much. There were three of them. <laughs>